Peace and blessings, brothers and sisters. I'm so excited to be bringing you this presentation today. So before we start, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please be with those that are listening to this presentation today, Lord. This, these words that I speak may be from you. They may glorify you, Father. They may give you them strength in you, Lord. And that their heart might be established in the knowledge of your truth, Lord Jesus, and set in the direction of you in all things. In these things I pray, your will always be done, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, with that, let's get into this. I hope you guys are doing well. It's been a trying time for me and all, a lot of people. Um, I hope these lessons in the word of the Lord brings you strength in these times and know that he draws near. With that, let's get into this. This presentation is called Sources of Christian Courage. It's and a part of my series, part two, Call to Courage. Most of the excerpts today that I'm going to be reading from are from William Gurnall in The Christian and Complete Armor. And this is from volume one, page 27 and 28 is where I get a lot of the readings. I updated it to modern English, and I also added some, uh, a little bit of, you know, I added a little bit to it to give it a little more strength and I added more verses. So I hope you guys get some strength out of this. So on your march to heaven, Christian soldier, you must be courageous against the opposition you face. Your principles must be well established. If not, your heart will be unstable. And an unstable heart is as weak as a house without cross beams and foundation. The first crosswind or flood will knock it down. Two things are required to fix your principles. The first thing you need to fix your principles is an established knowledge of God's truth. If you only have a nodding acquaintance with the king, you may be easily influenced to change allegiance, or at least remain neutral in the face of treason. This is the same with some professing Christians who only have a passing acquaintance with the gospel. They can't tell you exactly why they believe what they believe or why it's the truth. They say they have a hope, but can't articulate it. If they do hold on to some principles, as soon as tribulation comes, they are so unsettled, they will believe any wind of doctrine falling, failing to stand because they don't know God's promises. So that's why it's so important that we have a firm foundation in the knowledge of God's truth. Because when you are rolled over by Satan's tidal wave of temptations, you must cling on to the rock of God's truth or you will be swept away. His word is your stronghold in the midst of a raging storm. But you must have his promises in remembrance, ready to use when you need them. You must put on the belt of truth to hold the rest of your armor together. Don't ever go into battle with, without any part of your armor or you will suffer wounds. Do not wait until the boat is sinking to patch it. So we want to stand firm in him and not wait until we suffer these wounds to fix them. If we're strong in him, we will not get these wounds. The feeble-minded has no hope in the midst of a tempest. Only the strong 
will make it to safety. The feeble-minded will give up and drown, while the strong-minded, established in God's truth and word, with holy determination, will hold his head above the waves, grasping hold of Jesus' hand to lift them up. That's where we get our strength, is in the Lord, and in Jesus, and in the Holy Spirit. In Matthew, Jesus said this to Peter. Come, said Jesus. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. So he was afraid of the strength of the wind. The devil will be like a wind. It will blow you over unless you have Jesus to pull you out and to give you strength. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of Peter. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Jesus said this often. You of little faith. The little faith he was talking about was the faith in God and his promises. They didn't have it. They had little faith in what he said. And not enough of it anyway. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who approaches him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Hebrews 11.6. So, diligently seek. How do we we expect to be strong in the Lord if we don't claim his promises and believe in him? To be strong, we must know God's truth and his word. Scripture has this promise. The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits, from Daniel 11.32. An angel told Daniel which men would stand for God when tempted and persecuted by Antiochus. Some would be taken by bribery, and some would buckle under intimidation and threats. But there were those few who were firmly grounded in their faith would do great things for God. In flatteries, they would be incorruptible. To the power of force, unconquerable, standing firm in their faith. So we must have a firm foundation in God's promises and always have them in remembrance or we will fall like the men in this story. The next principle is a heart set in the right direction. I lost my place. Where are we? A heart set in the right direction. Only having knowledge of things of Christ is not enough. You must also follow Christ with your heart. This should be the primary focus. If your heart is not fixed as your primary if your heart is not fixed in Jesus as your primary focus, your principles or systems of belief, as good as they may be will hang unsecured and will be as useless as a poorly stringed bow in the heat of battle. If you only have half-hearted determination, you will not progress very far for Christ. Neither will the heart with selfish motives or false motives um, make it far with Christ. Even hypocrites will show some strength conveying a shadow of the spirit in the moment. But when push comes to shove, he will soon surrender. In other words, when he is called to give up what is evil and deny that which he covets, he gives in without a fight. If you want to be a true soldier for Christ, you will not flirt with any of the desires of your heart that are contrary to your new nature in him. These desires will seduce you and steal your heart because we know. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. We must then fight with a new resolve to serve Christ only. Therefore, 
If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. So we will gain strength in that if we know that we're new with a new resolve. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Let's consider Jehu from 2 Kings 9 and 10. When Jehu was called to reign and destroy Ahab and Jezebel, he was so zealous and courageous for the Lord in the beginning. Then why did his resolve fail him before his work was half done? Because his heart was never set on God alone. The very ambition that stirred up his zeal at first, in the end quenched and killed it. He compromised with evil men to reach his goal, that which he desired. When, then, when he received the throne, he dared not put God's plan into action for fear of provoking those same evil men. He was afraid of losing his kingdom. Second Kings 10.31 says, Yet Jehu was not careful to follow the instructions of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn away from the sins that Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit. In short, his heart was set on the world's pleasure and worldly gain, and not God. As a faithful follower of Jesus, we should always strive to make God first above all, because the gate is narrow and the path is straight. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. Matthew 7, 13, and 14. Isaiah 35, 8 says, And there will be a highway called the way of holiness. The unclean will not travel it, only those who walk in the way and fools will not stray onto it. So, a friend of the world is an enemy to God. So set your heart on the Lord, and not on the world. Make him first in all things, and all else will fall into place. In James 4.4 4 it says, You adulterous people, you do not know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I like the saying back in the 90s, what would Jesus do? I would like to bring this back. This is just like, you know, this is such an awesome saying, and it's something good to keep in your mind at all times. What would Jesus do in this situation? This is a good motto to live your life by. And ask yourself this question when faced with any decision. Will this glorify God? What example am I setting? Am I only doing this to fulfill selfish desires? These are just a few questions you can ask yourself. You you have rest in Jesus, so take courage in him. Make his heart your heart. So set your heart in the right direction. Come to me, all ye that are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. In Isaiah 41, 13, it says this, For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and tells you, do not fear, I will help you. Psalms 55, 22 says this, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. So if you put all your faith in him, he will not let you be shaken because he is your strength. So take take your courage in the Lord and not in the power of your own might. Lean on Jesus to help you with all of your infirmities. Call upon him, and he will sustain you. 
and give you courage and strength to face the giants in your life. Make God first. This is the first commandment, and everything else will fall into place, including loving your neighbor. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added into you. Matthew 6.33 Trust the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Finally, take faith in God's love. It will work a mighty work in you through the Holy Spirit. I also would like to share a triumph in faith. This is from where's my verse. Oh, it got erased. Anyway, I think this is in Second Corinthians. Mistake. I'll put it in the comments below. It got erased on my notes somehow. But this is the triumph of faith. Ups oh, from Romans. Okay, let's go back here. Romans 5. This is from Romans 5. Let me get back to it here. I lost my place. There we go. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Faith in God and strength in Jesus will set our heart in the right direction. In turn, this will help us overcome temptation with his strength. So, with our heart set in the right direction toward God and strength in Jesus, it will help us overcome temptation with his strength. This is what Thomas Watson had to say about overcoming temptation. So how do we fight the good fight so as to overcome temptation? We need to fight in the strength of Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 Grace needs to be strengthened by Christ. If not, we will flee from the fight. Some Christians try to fight with vows and resolutions. And they... And because they're trying to overcome with their own strength, they're eventually defeated. It will also leave them in sad shape because they cannot do this. And it discourages and defeats them, putting them into a state of despair. So we must engage in this battle against the spiritual antagonists with the strength of Christ. Like David set out to defeat Goliath in the name of the Lord knowing that he couldn't, but God could. God was his armor. The armor that they tried to give him didn't fit him because God was his armor. But David said to the Philistine, you come against me with the sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. 1 Samuel 17:45. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Isaiah 54, 17. And they have overcome him by reason of the blood of the Lamb, and by the reason of the word of their testimony, and they have not loved their life unto death. Revelation. 12, 11. Prayer is our most effective weapon. Let me say that again. 
prayer is our most effective weapon. Prayer whips the devil. The arrow of prayer put into the bow of promise and shot with the hand of faith pierces the old serpent. I really like this saying from William Gurnall, and I want to repeat it again. The arrow of prayer put into the bow of promise and shot with the hand of faith pierces the old serpent. Prayer brings close by God close by our side. It brings him to us, so we have him for our, with us for our strength. When he is by our side, we are our strongest. Let us pray that the Lord will enable us to overcome our spiritual enemies, those powers of spiritual wickedness. When Joshua was fighting in the valley below, this is when Moses was in, against Amalek. When Joshua was fighting in the valley below, Moses had his hand lifted up and was praying to God on the mount. As long as Moses held his up his hands, Israel prevailed. But when he lowered them, Amalek prevailed. The battle belongs to the Lord. And I lost another verse there. I keep things getting divert, deleted here. The battle belongs to the Lord. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged before the king of Assyria and the vast armies that are with him, for there is a greater one with us than with him. So the battle belongs to the Lord. So remember that in your prayers and gain strength from him. So while we are fighting, let us be praying. So finally, brothers and sisters, I'm going to end with this, with the full armor. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And having done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness arrayed, and with your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of, spirit, of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Pray in the Spirit at all times, with every kind of prayer and petition. To this end, stay alert with all perseverance in your prayers for all the saints. The way to overcome is on our knees. Like Paul, we must keep the faith and finish the race. So when we are weary, we pray. When we are tempted, we pray. Never cease in your communication with the Father and with your walk with the Son. Live in the Spirit and war against the flesh, and you will do well. He is the source of strength, three and one. So glorify the Father, follow the Son, listen to the Holy Spirit's prompting. God bless you, brothers and sisters. I hope this has been well, a good lesson, and I hope it really edified you and the Lord. And uh, with that, God bless.